Okay, good afternoon, and thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Becca Wasser, a fellow in the defense program here at a Center for a New American Security, where I'm also the co-lead for the Gaming Lab. Uh, today, we are launching a new speaker series entitled The Mission Brief, and I am so excited to be your host for this series. The Mission Brief is going to feature deep dive conversations with senior civilian and military leaders, where we're going to delve into some of the critical issues of defense strategy, force planning, and operations with an aim to think about how it is that the United States can better prepare to meet future challenges. Joining me today to kick off this series is Lieutenant General Clint Hynout, who happens to be Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategy, Integration, and Requirements for the U.S. Air Force. General Hynout, thank you so much for being here today. Becca, as always, it is wonderful to be with you and the CNAS audience. Uh, I'm excited about today's conversation. Me too. I'm super excited about today's conversation, and I hope it lets the audience in on some of the discussions that you and I have had in the past, because uh, those have tended to be fairly lively ones. Um, before we you know, get into sort of the meat of everything and uh, kick off today's discussion, I want to talk a little bit about the Mission Brief Speaker Series. Each discussion in this series is going to be public, it's going to be on the record and we are going to be recording it. Uh, so after each event, uh, we are going to be posting a video of the of um, the day's discussion to our website. So in case you can't catch every single installment in this series, there is a way to still keep up with it. And the way that this series is going to work is that each session is going to have a specific topic, which is the mission brief for the day. So for example, today, we're focusing on uh, future force design for the US Air Force. Uh, in common sort of parlance, that means talking about how it is that the Air Force should be structured, equipped, uh, organized and manned to achieve its strategic aims. So each event is going to kick off with me asking our speaker to deeply, uh, to uh, you know, sort of briefly describe what the mission brief is. We're then going to dive into a set of questions that are intended to provide more detail as to how the United States is going to achieve its goals. And aside from nerding out about defense uh, policy and strategy more generally, um, you know, we're going to be looking at you know, some other topics like posture, capabilities, and operations. What we're really trying to do here with this series is to have a frank conversation about what the nation needs to do today to strengthen its ability to contend with challenges in the future, including some of the challenges that are stemming from great power competitors like China. And so after our deep dive com conversation, we're going to shift to questions uh, from you, the audience, about the mission brief. And this is really your opportunity to ask critical questions to shape how it is that you know, leaders are thinking about future threats that America may face, um, and to provide feedback about how you think the nation should be uh, preparing to meet those challenges. Uh, to submit your questions, you know, please use the question and answer function uh, in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will note that we are not taking any anonymous questions, so if you want your question to be answered, please identify yourself. Uh, alternatively, uh, you can ask questions or comments on Twitter. Just use hashtag uh, CNAS2021. So without further ado, let's get started with the question of the day. General Highnote, what is today's mission brief? Becca, today's mission brief is about what type of Air Force the country needs in the future. So uh, it, the honest truth is, is that we have to have a different Air Force for tomorrow's challenges than we had for yesterday's challenges, which means we have to change. Militaries don't like to change. And that's a problem, right? And, and, uh, and it's, a, it, it's certainly a fact of life for us as we try to take these very successful institutions and move them forward into the future. So my chief of staff of the Air Force, General Charles Key Brown, has actually written that we need to accelerate change or lose. And I think there are some people out there who still kind of go, there's no way the Air Force could lose. We have the best Air Force in the world. And, and certainly I'm very proud 
of what my institution has accomplished since it became an independent service way back in 1947. But we're looking to the future. And in fact, we do have to change if we're going to be relevant for the future. And so what I hope to talk with you today about is what kind of change that looks like. And, you know, change can be very uncomfortable. And so it's time to get uncomfortable and, and, uh, and, be, and embrace that uncertainty of what the future looks like. And, uh, and that's what, uh, what I certainly hope to talk with you in the audience about today. So as you mentioned future uncertainty, and before we kind of delve into what those changes are, I actually want to talk about some of those future challenges, right? There's no way that we could ever predict the future, but we are thinking a little bit about some of the challenges that might be, that we may end up facing. So, you know, at this juncture in time, how is it that you see air warfare changing? You know, is air superiority still an attainable goal and one that the U.S. Air Force should strive toward? Mm. Well, as usual, you hit with one of the most important questions up front. Uh, so the, the honest truth is, is as we have used the Air Force that we built and really the Joint Force that we built in the Cold War, and as we use that to meet the country's challenges over the next several decades, other countries have studied that. And in fact, some of our, the, our competitors studied it very, very well. You know, one of the things that I find fascinating is how many of our documents get translated in certain languages. And it, it probably won't come as a surprise to you that almost all of our seminal documents, I mean, they're on the web. You can go see Air Force Doctrine right now uh, in, in, uh, in, on the website. It's translated into Mandarin. And, uh, and it's studied by, uh, by uh, the officers in China. And in fact, there were some very interesting reactions to some of those doctrinal uh, documents over time. And that was especially true in the years since Desert Storm and to some degree with the, the conflict in, in Bosnia and Sarajevo. And what ended up happening is, is China in particular, but also Russia, spent a lot of time, effort, and investment in figuring out how to stop American air power. And when I say American air power, you know, it's, it is kind of a truism that we have four air forces, right? Uh, we, we have the, the, the United States Air Force, but the Army has a very significant aviation component to it. Same with the Marine Corps and certainly same with the, with the Navy. There's a reason for that. It's one of the most important military advantages that the United States brings to military competition. And so our potential adversaries saw that. And they invested in capabilities to stop that. Some of those would be good radars and, and some of those would be very good surface to air missiles and good fighter aircraft and good weapons. And, and in fact, we see that China, as an example, has invested in the spectrum of all of those things. And they have put them in places where it's very challenging for us. An example might be over Taiwan or even into uh, parts of Japan. And so you, you ask a really good question, which is, is air superiority attainable? And so let's go back. I know of no concept of the United States Joint Force where there's not some degree of air superiority required. You know, the, the last that we, we love to say this, and, and I'm going to say it one more time. The last time that, uh, that, that a, uh, a United States ground personnel, so a soldier, a Marine, was actually attacked from uh, red air, was in the, the Korean conflict. And, uh, and we tend to keep it that way. Uh, and uh, and that's being said, it is much more challenging, especially as you get closer and closer to China's borders. And when we start thinking about what does air superiority require, it's going to require us to think differently than we have in the past. So this idea of air dominance or air supremacy. I have a lot of trouble with that. I, I don't see that as being a viable thing to try to, uh, to try to establish. But for certain times, for certain operations in certain geographies, I absolutely believe that air superiority is attainable. And in fact, I believe it's a prerequisite to do the most important things. So that means that we have to think different about how we're going to penetrate into those contested areas and how we're going to create that effect of air superiority. At the very same time, our country and our airspace is going to be increasingly challenged. And we're going to have to also think about defensive air superiority. How do we protect the United States from attack? 
Uh, I'm very good friends with uh, folks up in Alaska right now, and they're they're telling me that their intercepts of Russian aircraft coming over the Arctic are as high as they've been in a very long time. And so those are the types of things that we are always going to be thinking about in the Air Force, both how do you project power through creating air superiority, even all the way to somewhere like over an ally, like uh, say Japan, and how do you defend the United States from attack with, with defense? And those are going to be the ways that we are uh, that we are going to recreate or reimagine air superiority for the for the next forty years. So related to that, what is the theory of victory for the U.S. Air Force in how they are going to prevail over increasingly advanced adversaries like China and Russia, who you just mentioned? Yeah. So, so the the as as you know, and 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 uh, and and I know you have the history about this. The words "theory of victory" have a very interesting connotation right now, and uh, and so maybe we ought to take just a little step back and talk through kind of where we are right now at this point in uh, in the United States and how we're thinking about strategy. So, as we speak. There is a new national security strategy being written in the White House. There's a new national defense strategy being written in uh, the Pentagon. There, there is a new joint warfighting concept that is being iterated on and war gamed out in the in the Pentagon and and in the Joint Staff. And there's so many other things that are associated with the new administration coming in and a rethinking of our strategy. And so all of those things could have a great deal of influence on the types of military forces that we need to invest in. Okay. So that being said, I suspect the way that we're going to go is that we have to be able to defend our friends. Uh, meaning that if we want to, you know, we have an alliance with Japan, we need to be able to defend Japan. If there was any aggression, we have an alliance with the Philippines. We'd need to be able to defend the Philippines. We have, we certainly have talked a lot in recent weeks about the possibility of defending Taiwan against an aggressive act from China. And in fact, uh, there's been quite a few uh, press articles about that recently. So the, the theory would be, can we project power? And part of that would be air power. Can we project power and defend? Uh, and so many folks will call that denial. Uh, and in fact, there's a really good book out right now by Elbridge Cole to be called a, a strategy of denial. And he kind of takes you through what that what that means. But when we think about that, we're, we're, we're talking about using air power that is both offensive and defensive, but it's very defensive uh, against our friends. I mean, meaning that we're we're defending what happens to them. And, uh, and we use the power projection capabilities that we have within the Air Force to do that. So it's gonna be really important for us to create power projection capabilities that can survive and defend in those very contested areas, which means they just need to be different than they were before. And th so this gets into the exciting part. What we think is that uh, increasingly, it's, you're going to be thinking about military power in a, in a different way, in a much more holistic way. So it's not just going to be about airplanes or about ships or about tanks or about satellites. Uh, it's going to be much more about how do you use the different things that you have in different ways, in, in connected ways, so that you can, if you need to, if, if, if there's a a missile coming at you, then maybe the right answer is not to shoot another missile at it, but to do something to negate it in another way. And maybe that is in another domain. We typically talk about the domains being air, land, sea, space, and cyberspace, and the electromagnetic spectrum connects them all together. So what you're really trying to think about is a reimagining of warfare, where instead of having an air campaign and a land campaign and a sea campaign and a space campaign, you're instead going to be thinking about them all as one. And you're going to be pretty agnostic about where your, your sensing comes from because you want to be able to see what the enemy is doing. So you're going to have sensors, but you don't really care where those are. They could be on the ground in, in space, in the air. And you're going to be pretty agnostic about where your effects come from. Uh, they could come from the ground, from the sea and from the air. And when we talk about all domain operations, you're really talking about taking what up until now have been fairly stovepipe capabilities in the domains. You know, airmen look at air power and, and sailors look at sea power and, 
and soldiers look at ground power and, and we're going to connect them and merge them in a way where it's going to be very difficult to uh, to to kind of describe where, say, land power stops and air power starts. Uh, that's what all domain is going to bring to us. Now, that's just it, I, I want to say that's more than theory is that there's real practical aspects of this. So if all parts of your joint force can say, as an example, attack maritime targets. So this would be very likely that if uh, there's a attack uh, by China, part of it comes from their Navy. It, it, that's just the way it's probably going to go. They're going to project power out. Well, we want to be able to attack ships from all domains, air, land, sea, space, and cyberspace. And if you can do that, it's going to be incredibly difficult. No invasion force in history has fought it against an all domain defense and won. And we're going to try to make that real uh, in our time. Why? It's not because we want to go to war. We don't. We want to defend. We want to deter. And uh, and we want to keep uh, keep everybody trading with one another and keep uh, keep keep children going to school and uh, and, and keep uh, standards of living going up and keep uh, sharing innovation around the world. I mean, those are the things we want. We use military power so that we don't have to fight. And and I, we think that a good all domain defense is going to be the way to make that happen. So uh, it's a long question, but you ask a really tough one. And so uh, so I hope that that gets, uh, that gets after it a little bit. No, that was great. I do want to point out that you said wargaming before I did, because I know that you and I both can't have a conversation without wargaming coming up in some way. That's um, exactly right. So thinking a little bit about that, how it is that you think the Air Force is going to be fighting in the future, can you talk a little bit about some of the force structure changes that need to take place in order to actualize the ability of the Air Force and frankly, the Joint Force to fight yes. in that way? Yes, a great question as always. So the the we have thought in terms of fairly large elements of force structure. Uh, you know, uh, of battle groups, of, of divisions, of, uh, of wings and, and large formations. So what we certainly believe in the future is that the, the best way of defending yourself and, and, and certainly, well, certainly one of the best ways of defending yourself, especially true given all the firepower that an adversary like China could bring to a fight, is you've got to disperse, you've got to spread out, you've got to be able to take a punch to the point where they can't concentrate on just a few targets and really negate your ability to fight. And so what we see is that instead of large bases, instead of large formations, instead of large amounts of ships moving together, we see the dispersal aspect as being really important. So that means that you've got to be able to have smaller units, but still have the capability to fight within those units. And so an example of that might be that instead of having one or two or three major bases in, in certain parts of of, uh, of the Pacific, as an example, or certain parts of Europe, you would want to have lots of ability to spread out and use different bases and small airfields and even highway landing strips and things like that. But that requires a tremendous amount of human capital, of leadership, because instead of, uh, instead of being able to consolidate your operations, you're now having to spread them out and you're having to recreate operations on a smaller scale, but on a much more spread out basis. And that means that you're going to have to have leaders that can execute on what we call mission command, which is that we believe that if, if they understand what the commander wants them to do, they understand the commander's intent, that they can go out and make it happen and uh, and lead small units to uh, to, as an example, produce air power or produce fires or produce protection capability and that all that could come together in a large way that it could scale and we could bring that to the most important thing, which, as I said before, is going to be stopping what it is that our adversaries are trying to do. We're going to defend. And uh, and so the, the what one of the parts of the question that you're uh, you're asking is going to be this idea of going from big units to small units to, to breaking up the elements of combat power and dispersing them and then bringing them together, or converging them when you need to. 
And another aspect of it that I think is going to be fascinating as we go through, and we don't even know exactly how this is going to unfold yet, but it is clear that the uh, the, the autonomous collaborative platforms, we like to call them, or, or uh, unmanned systems uh, are, uh, are going to be a major part of the future of warfare. And, it, and so we're really looking to what does a unit of combat power look like if they're flying all of these small uh, unmanned aircraft around and then they're all uh, swarming to go accomplish different things. I don't know what that looks like yet. We have some pretty good ideas and some good work has been done, but we need to go experiment with that and to, uh, and to figure out exactly how we want to build those units. But that's kind of exciting, too, because we get a chance to kind of shape that for uh, the next generation of airmen. And I'm excited about that. So you talked a little bit about, you know, this sort of idea of distributed operations. So I want to sort of get into two parts about that. One is posture and the other is operational concepts. I'll start with the posture piece. You know, how is it that you think that, uh, you know, the Air Force needs to create posture changes in order to support some of these future Air Force operations and force structure. You mentioned the Indo-Pacific. There's certainly been a lot of chatter about how, um, how the DOD is going to shift its posture in that region, particularly with the upcoming uh, Global Force Posture Review. But you know, what is it that you need in the Indo-Pacific if you are trying to enhance the survivability of air assets um, and if you're trying to enhance some of your warfighting capabilities? No, great, it, great question. And posture is a major part of what we would consider to be a deterrence, uh, you know, a, 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 a situation of deterrence in the, in the Indo-Pacific region, um, which means that we have to be credible in our ability to generate combat power. Uh, even while we're being attacked. And so it's not credible to do that from one or two or three major bases. They're fixed. Everybody knows where they are. You can look at them on Google Maps and uh, and you can target them. And, and if you have missiles that fly a long way and China has a lot of those missiles, then it doesn't make any sense to consolidate your power in, in, in fixed locations. And so what we have to do is we have to spread out, which means that each of the pieces of infrastructure that we're going to need has got to have some level of readiness and some level of prepositioning uh, that we uh, that we can use. And so instead of just a few bases, you have a lot of different options to be able to generate combat power from. And I think that's in many ways just the, the beginning of posture. Because eventually what I think you're going to find is mobility is one of the best defenses against the types of, uh, of capabilities that our adversaries have invested in. And so what we want to be able to do is be mobile. Uh, to move around. Uh, it's hard for them to catch up if we're moving. And, and so we see as a joint force, movement is a great defense. And what that means for air power is eventually we're going to have to learn how to generate air power away from the fixed runways. And so maybe we go from having long runways to air, aircraft that can operate off of really short runways. And there'd be a lot of those around. I mean, maybe just any old road out there could be that, you know. And uh, and, and the, the, you go from instead of tens of bases, you go to hundreds and maybe even thousands. But then you could also think through the, the idea of, of having vertical lift, of having rocket assisted takeoff, of having all sorts of different forms of air power where you can, uh, in, in effect, be runway independent. So what I think is you're going to see over time, and I'm talking about 15 years around, maybe 20 as we go forward, but you're going to see us expand the, the capabilities of infra infrastructure that we have right now. I think the Indo-Pacific is going to be where that happens. And, uh, and in each of those, we're going to try to create the, the minimum viable capability to generate power from those. Uh, you can think of those as austere islands with airstrips and things like that. But then over time, what you're going to see is us not having to be dependent on runways. Uh, and in fact, moving to something that looks much more like uh, a lot of movement uh, where we can use mobility to our advantage. You know, in so many ways, uh, our adversaries have invested in mobile capabilities. Their surface air missiles are mobile. Their, uh, their radars are mobile. Their uh, SIGINT capability is mobile. And, and so it makes it very difficult to target. We've, we've had difficulty with that. We're getting better at it and we're going to get better at it going forward. Well, we want to create that same 
issue for them. And uh, and in, in effect, we, we think all forms of military power to include air power have got to be more mobile to generate and then be able to do that defense that we were talking about. So a lot of what you were just talking about, at least my understanding, fits underneath, uh, you know, sort of the banner of the operational concept of, you know, agile combat employment or ACE. You know, so does this mean that ACE is the operational concept of the future um, or is it another concept like JADC2 join all domain and control or is it something else? I think it's all of those, but let me explain. Uh, so, uh, so, so, in, because I think of it as a concept of concept, I, I don't know of any one operational concept that I think fits all of the different needs that we have for uh, for the future. And so, I, we in many ways knit the concepts together. So, the agile combat employment or ACE concept is that spreading out concept. It's get it's getting off of just a few bases to a lot of different airfields. Some of those may be really austere airfields and being able to operate off of those, be able to turn aircraft and, and reload uh, aircraft and get them going again and be able to survive attack and spread out so that any one or two attacks doesn't have an overarching effect against you, mitigate against those attacks by spreading out. But, uh, but that's just a part of it. Uh, uh, there's also going to be the part of how do you bring together the effects against the most important thing. Maybe that most important thing is the invasion force. There's an invasion being launched by one of our adversaries. There's, it's affecting our friends, and we've got to be able to stop it. Well, that could be aircraft. It could be ships. It could be tanks or whatever it is. Uh, and what we've got to be able to do is find them and be able to track them. And, and do something about those. And, and, and you got to do that at scale. I mean, you, you can't just hit 10 of them, expect everything's going to be okay. You've got to be able to, to take out 100 or 200 or 300 of these. And so what that gets into the idea of, of command and control across the domains. We talked about all domain operations. Well, if you're going to be able to bring all those domains together, you can't have one command and control system for air and one for ground and one for the sea and all that. You've got to be able to bring them together. And that's what we talk about when we talk about JADC2, Joint All Domain Command and Control. It's really nothing cosmic. It means that we're all on the same page. And if we have a important target that's out there, we're going to pick the best way to affect that target. That might be a cyber uh, in, intrusion into a system. It might be a ground launched cruise missile. It might be an air launch bomb. It might be a surface launched uh, missile that goes over and comes or a torpedo. All of those things could be true. And what you've got to be able to do is do it together. So one of the concepts that we've brought forward is this idea of joint all domain command and control. And it means we can make joint uh, all domain operations successful by all being on the same page. We, we all see what has to be done. Somebody makes a decision on what needs to be done and then the right forces executed. And sometimes we think of, of that as, as being part of a kill chain. In fact, you've heard uh, uh, the book by Chris Bros uh, called the, the Kill Chain. Uh, and it's because of that. It, it's this idea that uh, that you can connect all those things together. So, uh, so that's another major uh, concept that we have out there. I also think there's a major set of concepts about being interoperable and in interdependent with our allies and partners, uh, like understanding what it is that they can do and what we can do and making sure that we can bring the best of it together. And uh, we've got to be able to have defensive concepts that, that, that employ the best of their capabilities along with our capabilities and mix them well. And so that's another example. Of a, of a concept that we're uh, looking for. So in, in essence, you're seeing quite a bit of concepts that are out there. I'll close with this one because I think it may be the most important. We have to figure out how to do logistics uh, forward. Uh, we have to be able to think about going all the way, I mean, literally halfway around the world uh, and, and sustaining our forces and doing logistics and keeping our machines running, keeping our people running uh, and, and being able to figure out how to do joint logistics in a very difficult environment. I think that set of concepts are some of the most uh, interesting to me and we're making pretty good progress on that. 
So as we're thinking a little bit about these concepts, I want to think about the capabilities that are required to actually carry them out. You know, the Air Force has a number of modernization priorities. And so I'd like to get your thoughts on which programs you think are the most important and why. And sort of with that, if I can add in a sub question of sorts, which is what do you think the future force mix should be for the U.S. Air Force? Oh, boy. Um... You know, one of the things I've learned, typically we, the, the, you're asking a question that we like to call design, which is how, how everything fits together. And, you know, how do you put all the capabilities, the concepts, the people, the organization together and, and make it work? And one of the things I've, I've learned about design is that um, there's no one design. Uh, that, that in fact, uh, there are lots of different ways everything could fit together. And sometimes you, uh, sometimes you have design because, uh, you were forced to, to, as an example, live with a capability, an old capability longer than you wanted to. And, uh, and sometimes you, you actually are very intentional about the capabilities that you put into that design. But, uh, but true art within the, uh, within the military is being able to take all the different elements and put them together in ways that are effective. Um, okay, so, uh, so what does that look like for the future. Well, the first thing I'd say is we would, if we believe that this idea of all domain operations and the idea that the whole team has to work together, that you can't have individual components and expect that they're going to win in the future environment, then, then everything that we have, all of our capabilities have got to be able to interact with the, uh, with each other. They, they've got to be able to work together. Uh, and so that gets into the whole um, JAD C2 and the fact that all of our wet form, or all of our weapons, certainly the weapons we expect we would use in the high end fight, and all the platforms and and many of the uh, of the capabilities, uh, those uh, those got to come together. And, and in order to do that, you've got to be able to communicate. And and the key with that, and this is I think a really interesting uh, a part of where we're going is there's, uh, there's, there's kind of different ways of thinking about data. There's the way of thinking about data that you generate it all within your platform, within your capability, and you employ off of that data. A good example of that would be radar off of a fighter. So a fighter, many of our fighter aircraft have radars in the front. They see a target out there. They have an air-to-air -air missile, and they've got tracking data from their radar. They connect that to the missile, and they shoot. Um, that, that would be an own ship targeting problem. But increasingly what we see is that that's not good enough. Uh, in fact, we're going to need to find ways of connecting other targeting um, solutions to that fighter. Okay, now you start to get a slightly bigger world. And eventually you get to the point where you can't pass all of that data through bespoke uh, uh, commu you know, conduits. You need to be able to make the data available to the force as a whole, and then the force can pull whatever data it needs to be relevant. And so that sounds a lot like a cloud. And yes, we are actually thinking about the combat form of an edge cloud, of a, of a cloud that is working out into a very difficult contested area. We populate that with what we see with our sensors, and we use that data in as we need to, to affect our missions and to actually do. So it's, it's much more of a pull way of thinking about data than it is a push. Uh, and, and that's very unusual. And just honestly, we didn't build programs like that in the, in, the, in the past. And so one of the most important capabilities is we make use of the data in a very different way. And that means that we have to reconceptualize how we're going to feel capabilities. Uh, and so that's one of the, the major things that I see going forward. I talked about the, the idea of uh, we're not supposed to call them drones because uh, they don't just drone. They're very smart. They often have people behind them. Uh, but uh, but the, th this idea of large numbers of unmanned vehicles of autonomous collaborative platforms and how that could change uh, lots of different things. Certainly, I think you're going to see better weapons. And, and right now we're we're in uh, we're in need of a better air to air weapon, a better ship killing weapon, and a better uh, surface to air missile killing weapon. We call that an IADS killer. Uh, those are the things we got to have, and, and we're pursuing those as fast as we can. There are some new platforms coming down the road. Certainly, the KC forty six, our our new tanker. I've gotten a chance to fly in the KC forty six. I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, some of the um, some of the things that have been holding us back on uh, on getting it fielded are, are resolved. 
solving. And that's a good thing because I'm excited about that ability to use a tanker across all of our forces to make them better. Uh, the B-21, uh, our new bomber, uh, that we, you've seen silhouettes of it, uh, and, uh, and, and it has the potential to really be a, uh, a positive asset for us. And then um, certainly our, we're going to be fielding the F-35 in large numbers, uh, and the F-35 of the future will be very different than the one we're buying today. It will have much more ability to, to say, for example, do fusion and processing and, and, and to populate that cloud, as I was just talking about, and to pull data from it. So in, in many ways, it becomes a node of, uh, of important processing, not just a, a fighting aircraft that's out there. And then the the idea of human machine teaming has incredible possibility for us. And, and the, how are we going to use machines to do what machines do best and use humans to do what humans do best? And I have a feeling that's going to change a lot of things. It'll change the way we do command and control. It'll change the way that we do tactics and, uh, and who knows what else. Uh, so those are some ideas. Uh, as to uh, where we're going, our design incorporates all of those things and more. Uh, but I, the, the first thing always is, how are we going to get the data from where it is to where it needs to be? And uh, there seems to be some real movement in that area that I'm very excited about. Wow, there's definitely a lot going on. Um, I want to remind our audience to please keep these questions coming. I'm already seeing a bunch roll in and they are fantastic. So again, just use the Q&A function at the bottom of your toolbar, uh, you know, tweet at, tweet at CNAS or hashtag CNAS2021. Um, and just please remember to identify yourself with a question. Before we shift to hearing from you, the audience, uh, I want to ask one last question, and uh, that is about implementation. Um, and you know, implementation is often where the rubber meets the road for the US Department of Defense. So the Air Force has cited 2030 as a pivotal point for force modernization. You know, is the Air Force still measuring itself up against the 2030 benchmark? And if so, how is that coming along? How is it that you intend to go from here to there, you know, in terms of how are you planning on, you know, sort of what's the bridging concept between today while we wait for the future force to come online tomorrow and sort of where are the areas that we that you think that we're going to need to accept risk no and and in fact uh there there was a time when we thought we had until 2030 to change and generally we don't believe that anymore and so, uh, as I have said before, I'm very impressed with China's capability to accelerate their change, to, in fact, outpace our estimates of their modernization. And, uh, and you have to respect that. And you, and you have to be very, uh, <laughs> very, very, very impressed uh, with many of the investments that they're making and how they're paying off. So I, I think there is this idea about a journey of transformation that we have to walk. And it's not just what well, we're going to all aim for 2030. The interesting thing about 2030, of course, it's 2021 right now, is that by 2030, you could conceivably start new aircraft programs and have them be delivering by then. Whereas if you looked more like a 2027 time frame, it would be more difficult to imagine starting a new aircraft program from scratch and having it deliver in real numbers by then. I, I don't put anything past the American people. I'm not saying that we could never do it, but that has not been the timelines that we've been used to right now. So what you normally would think of is that you might be able to develop some weapons uh, between now and say a 2027 time frame. And I've already talked about three of those weapons that we think we've got to get in a very short amount of time. And that could really make things different for us in a good way. Certainly, I believe that we can communicate better. I don't know that we'll have the the uh, the all knowing, the all seeing JADC2 solution uh, by 2027, but we can communicate better and we, and we need to do that. Um, I certainly believe that training matters and, and realistic training matters. 
And certainly if we were to have to fight in an earlier time frame, say like a 2026, 2027, training would make a huge difference there. I, I also believe that we could make some decisions about logistics and have those be more resilient than they are today. We certainly see the problems when in the civilian supply chains right now, uh, those also manifest themselves in military supply chains. And so we see that in many ways, those supply chains are brittle and we could make uh, decisions to make those more resilient and less brittle. So those are some things we could do in the short term as we're looking. And then we start thinking about well, what would new aircraft look like? What would new platforms look like? And then over the, the even longer term than that, you start to th see things like how does AI enabled autonomy, how does quantum computing play inside of uh, the, the military structure and how does that increase our effectiveness overall? And then even further down the line than that, I, I believe that over time, many of the air uh, missions that we're used to doing, the missions that we have traditionally thought about in air get accomplished in space or in cyber, but especially in space. Space has a tremendous interesting uh, relevance in the future. And in so many ways, the technologies that we're seeing are more aerospace than they are air and space, i.e. they transit between those. So a hypersonic weapon, certainly a boost glide weapon is a space weapon. It's also an air weapon. Uh, and it, in so many ways I could go through many different forms of military power and talk about how there is an aerospace uh, aspect to them. And so as I see going forward, I see the shifting of missions, some of those shift to uh, air power that's generated away from, uh, say, fixed runways and things like that. Some of that becomes very, very long range and, and is kept at a very high state of readiness. And then some of those may actually be in space. And we migrate those missions to space in a way that uh, that could be very compelling uh, going forward. And, and that don't, doesn't have to be destabilizing. It might actually be more stabilizing. Uh, and when it comes to great power competition, then say some of the uh, vulnerabilities that both sides have today. But as uh, I think what, what you say about this journey or this bridge is going to be a major part of the defense debate going forward is how do you tell the story of of modernization and even transformation. I know the T word can be a tough word for people. We could talk about why that is. Uh, some of your audience may not remember the days of transformation and what that meant, but uh, but the, you know this idea of a story of transformation over time and and have waypoints along the way. And I gave you just a feel for those waypoints. And I really think that that's going to be some of the art of telling the story going forward. The story of how the military changes to adapt to the the demands of our time that uh, you know for for the next generation well let's shift to questions from the audience uh because we have a lot of really great ones and i have a feeling we're not going to be able to get through all of them because uh we could definitely sit here all day and talk but i know you don't have time for that and i suspect our audience is quite busy too um so let's start off with what i hope will be a fairly uh easy and straightforward question that comes from lauren what are the platforms currently in rdt and &E ready to transition in 15 years that are runway independent and are in the numbers being described for procurement? Sure. Um, and this is Lauren, great question. So uh, I think where you go with this and, and you're, I think that the key part of your question was numbers. Uh, there, uh, the the ability of the United States manufacturing base, and, the, and frankly, the manufacturing base of our uh, of our closest allies and partners, uh, it, are we going to be able to make um, manned aircraft uh, at, at those the scale we need? that are runway independent? I'm not so sure that I think we are. I think we could have a few and there's some good concepts out there about vertical takeoff and landing and certainly the armor. Uh, the army is working on the future vertical lift concepts and things like that. Are you gonna have the numbers you need to be able to affect the, the battle space you need to? I'm not certain. I actually think that the potential lies with the unmanned aircraft. And I see a whole 
new set of companies out there that are willing and able to manufacture aircraft in large numbers that are in fact, you know, some of them are pretty small and some of them are medium size and a lot of them are, are not that expensive. Uh, and you don't have to design them to the same tolerances that you do if you have a human in the cockpit. And, uh, and in many ways you can save some of the, the weight and some of the space and some of the avionics in, uh, by not having a human in the cockpit. And, uh, and we see the autonomy driven, uh, that being able to fly these autonomously, that is coming along very quickly. So I think what we would like to see in the future, and we'll know in 10 to 15 years if we were successful, we certainly think that the major defense companies the primes, we like to call them, have a huge role to play. But we also see this incredibly interesting uh, part of the industrial base that has the potential to produce large amounts of aircraft, unmanned aircraft, autonomous collaborative platforms that might actually be able to be runway independent, that could recover with parachutes, that could land on almost anything, uh, that, that wouldn't have to be fixed in space. And I would love to see a, a healthy defense industrial base where small startups are aspiring to big things and they're bringing their best ideas and mid-level companies are producing uh, really, really high quality products uh, at, 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 a, at a scale that, uh, that we can use. And certainly we bring those together with a reference architecture so that they're all interoperable and they can be used together. And then the, the large companies, the primes, are, are, are able to do those very military specific things that uh that that really only we can do uh that would be a defense industrial base wor worth uh really building and uh and we're certainly hoping to see that so transitioning a little bit from mm -hmm. that uh but because you talk so much about um unmanned vehicles uh i'm going to take this question from eric who says it sounds a lot uh it sounds like a lot of what you're talking about is heavily dependent on two things unmanned vehicle autonomy and or continuous uninterrupted communications are there fragile aspects of this concept of operations that worry you whether this is logistics spoofing decision making hierarchy could you delve into that a little bit Erica, I am concerned that we should assume our potential adversaries will try to fracture us. And when you talk about uninterrupted communications, I don't believe there'll be any of that. I believe that all communications will, will in some ways be fractured. Sometimes they'll be healthy and come back together. We'll knit them back together in a resilient way. But I certainly do think that we have to be able to fight fractured. We can't just throw up our hands and go, well, I can't talk to higher headquarters, therefore I'm done. Well, uh, I believe that this generation of young leaders that we have is very able to continue fighting in limited communication scenarios. And so in, in essence, I don't believe that the human in the loop is the weakness. I actually think it's the strength in this particular case. Now, you talked a lot about unmanned vehicles and about the human machine teaming. I do believe that there are senses or tiers of autonomy that we would want to use. And even when fractured, some of that autonomy could mitigate the fracturing, uh, could continue to do what the commander intended for it to do. Now, there are going to be limits to that. We certainly would not want to take steps to go to things that would not be able to, say, be vetoed and things like that. And we would want to put limits on things like time and geography and mission set. But in that context, and certainly in the context of a great power war, I do believe that tiers of autonomy would help to mitigate some of the fracturing that we can expect on the battlefield. So... Thinking a little bit more about some of our allies and partners, Kevin M has a question uh, specifically about uh, our Japanese allies. So, in view of the China, uh, in view of the China threat, uh, what operational role would you like to see for the Japan Air Self Defense Force, um, and how would you like to see that role reflected in Japan's development of its next generation fighter? Yeah. Um, I, so I'm going to answer that in a general way and in a specific way. So the, the general way is every one of our allies and partners, and especially the ones that 
are in very close proximity to what could be our adversaries. An example of this would be the Baltic countries and NATO. And certainly we're seeing unrest right now uh, when it comes to uh, some of the NATO's uh, eastern flank. Uh, this could be Taiwan. This could be the Philippines. This could be Vietnam. This could be uh, Japan. Uh, I think all of them need to take their national uh, strengths as an example, Taiwan is probably the best producer of, uh, of semiconductors in the world right now. And, uh, and, and they can manufacture things. I think uh, all of them, we would like to see them take their individual strengths and knit them together so that they're the most defensive. Uh, uh, they have the most defensive posture they could put forward. Sometimes we call that the porcupine effect. Uh, we want these countries to be porcupines in reference to or in, in comparison to, uh, say, Russia or China. Um, and uh, that doesn't mean that Russia or China couldn't do something and couldn't fight their way through those defenses, but it means that it needs to hurt a really lot. Uh, and, uh, and we want to see those, those countries adopt the best defense for them. So, uh, so that could include, in the case of Japan, Japan is a very technologically proficient ally. Uh, they build things and they build things well. And so uh, what we want them to do is build defensive capabilities that make it much more difficult for China to imagine uh, doing things that are aggressive against Japan. That because it just wouldn't work, or if it would work, their cost would be so high when it comes to the type of uh, of things they'd have to do versus Japan. And so that means that the Japan uh, self defense forces need to be great at self defense. And in so many ways, uh, Japan can create uh, anti access area denial capabilities of its own. And we would like to see that. In fact, we would like to fold into that uh, because we think that would be the most compelling vis-a-vis uh, -vis their, their number one uh, threat, China. And so, um, so what does that mean for things like the FX? Well, the FX needs to be able to integrate into that entire defense system. Uh, it needs to be a node in that system. It doesn't need to be an individual platform with individual radar and individual weapons. It needs to be part of the network. And if it is part of the network, it needs to be feeding the network and it needs to be receiving from the network and it needs to be integrated into that network as a defensive node. If they're able to do that, I suspect that the, uh, the defenses that Japan could put forward would be very compelling to the Chinese calculus. Uh, and that I think is best for uh, the Japanese interest and best for our interest as well. Okay, we're gonna take one last question from the audience um, and it is one that warms my heart. Uh, from Kelly, can you speak to how the Air Force has used wargaming effectively? And do you have some additional insights that you can share? Uh, General Hynote, I promise you that I am not secretly Kelly and I did not just write that question. Oh, yeah. So, Kelly, uh, one of the things that I love talking with Becca about is wargaming, because I actually think wargaming is one of the best analysis tools we have. Uh, you know, in so many ways, when you think about analysis, you think about uh, physics based modeling, simulations, and all of those are really important. And uh, and as an example, stochastic simulation is a is also a very interesting tool that we use to think about force design and, and how we want to uh, to put things together together. But the neat thing about wargaming is it's, it has a human interaction to it. And it, it just like war does, right? It, and it's really difficult for us to go out and to, to be able to understand our true weaknesses. Because in so many ways, when we train, we train as uh, small units and, and we don't see the big picture sometimes. And the neat things about war games uh, you know, we don't have a regular season like we've got the, the NFL uh, that's going on right now. Uh, we don't have an ability to see how our strategies are playing out vis-a-vis -vis our competitors and, and to make adjustments along the way. One of the great uh, things that the sports team gets is they get immediate feedback. Uh, we don't get that. Uh, as we build uh, capabilities. And so Wargaming gives us feedback and it gives us feedback of red versus blue, of the human red side and the human blue side. And there's some interaction there that's really, really important to understand. And I will tell you, I have been surprised many, many times about what I saw in a war game. But then I go back and I go, hmm, 
that could happen. And I'm glad that we saw it in peacetime so we can prepare for it. And, uh, and, and that was a blind spot that we had. So, so we use wargaming to be able to uncover our vulnerabilities, to expose our blind spots, to see where things are working and where things are. And we, uh, we test hypotheses. And so uh, you asked about, are there any insights that are out there about some of these hypotheses? And certainly uh, as we look at the things like networking and unmanned systems and uh, the ability for all domain operations, those are things that we see that work in the wargaming scenarios. And that's why we're pursuing them. I think the number one insight that I have, and we just got done talking about uh, Japan as an ally, the number one insight I have is the more that we can uh, that we can help our allies and friends to develop their own defensive capabilities. It is the highest payoff thing that we can do. Uh, and so uh, I'm I'm a major and this came out of the wargaming. I'm a major proponent of rethinking the way that we share military technologies with our allies and partners and the way that we partner with them on concept development and we come together in an interdependent way uh, because it is the most compelling thing we could do. The war gaming proves it. Wow. I mean, I couldn't have made a better case for war gaming myself. Um, and, you know, I'll just quickly take this as a mo moderator's prerogative before we end, just to sort of do a two finger question on that, which is, are you also using war gaming as one of your tools for measuring how some of those force design changes that you've detailed throughout our conversation, uh, whether those are you know, coming to fruition, whether change is occurring and whether it's happening at the appropriate pace, is that one of the metrics uh, that you're using, yeah. one of the tools? Yeah, unfortunately, um, the Wargaming says that we're not accelerating our change fast enough. Uh, and so we have got to do better. And of course, uh, my, my chief of staff uh, wrote Accelerate, Change, or Lose for that reason. He's right. The Wargaming proves him right. Uh, and we've got to go faster. And part of that is sharing that Wargaming data with our stakeholders. An example of that would be um, members of Congress and their staffs. Uh, in uh, the last major Wargaming uh, cycle that we did, we invited members of Congress and their, and their staffs to help us shape the game. And we took the results back to them to show them what happened. And they even came and visited a little bit as the game was being executed. And, uh, and, and we felt like that was a really important thing because we wanted everybody to get the insights from the game to include Congress because they have such an important role to play when it comes to transforming the military. And uh, we feel like the Wargaming was one of the ways of helping us tell that story of the type of change we need and the fact that we need to get after it faster. Well, General Hynode, I think that's all we have time for today. So thank you for what has been an illuminating discussion. I know that I got a lot of out of it and I suspect our audience did too. Um, for our audience, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, stay tuned for more Mission Brief events. We've got some great conversations planned, and I hope that you're going to join us for that. So until next time, folks, thank you.